Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Phil Anglovich and Caroline Moreau of Johns Hopkins about the impact that the pandemic has had on access to contraception and unintended pregnancies due to COVID-related disruptions in healthcare. Let's listen. Phil Anglovich and Caroline Moreau, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks very much for having us. Delighted to be here. So today I wanted to talk to you about uh, the impact that COVID has had on family planning. I know that uh, you all have done research in low and middle income countries, sub-Saharan Africa, and I know there were a lot of concerns about what the disruptions of the pandemic would mean for family planning. So Phil, I'm wondering if you could talk to me first about sort of the situation on the ground in terms of family planning in these countries. Sure. Um, Thanks for the question. Uh, So PMA is a project. We work in countries mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in uh, in, we work in India. And in the countries where we work, the family planning situation really varies dramatically. So we work in some countries like Kenya that has high levels of contraceptive use and uh, fertility rates that have been declining for recent years, um, fairly you know at a fairly decent pace. Uh, But then we work in other contexts like Democratic Republic of Congo, for example where fertility rates are incredibly high. Women have an average of over uh, six children um, per woman. And contraceptive use um, was, you know, is very low traditionally, although it's been increasing more in recent years. So um, one of the things I really like about working on this project is that we get exposed to a a great range of environments in terms of family planning. Um, But I think there are some themes that are consistent across a lot of these countries. Um, both in terms of what was expected to happen maybe due to COVID, as well as some of the challenges that women face in terms of being able to access contraception. So, Caroline, could you tell me, um, you know, what you've learned about the impact that COVID has had? Yes, sure. So we had the opportunity to collect data just before the pandemic and again collect data between May and July of 2020. And so we were able to track changes over time. And what we generally found, so we worked in four localities, Burkina Faso, the DRC Kinshasa, Lagos in Nigeria, and Kenya. And generally across these different geographies, what we found is that women's need for contraception remained pretty stable. The same proportion of women needed contraception from pre-COVID to COVID pandemic. And among these women who needed contraception, we found actually an increase in contraceptive use in two geographies, Burkina Faso and Kenya, meaning more women were able to use contraception during the pandemic compared to pre-COVID levels. While in Kinshasa and Lagos, we found pretty stable uh, indicators, meaning the same amount of women were using contraception during the pandemic relative to before the pandemic. I've seen some statistics that maybe suggest otherwise, Phil. Could you walk me through that? Sure. Well, there's been a narrative and a concern when COVID started that uh, it would have a dramatic impact on women's access to family planning um, services. And that was certainly well-founded because we expected that early on in the pandemic, health facilities would be shut down or severely restricted. Women would have great difficulty with accessing uh, services and uh, health services overall, and especially family planning. So this is exactly what we had in mind when we collected our data. Um, And we asked women questions like, uh, did you have any difficulties in accessing uh, health services? and tabulated the percentage of women that experienced these difficulties. 
And the results were fairly consistent across all of our geographies that around 90% of women did not experience any difficulties in accessing health services during the COVID, early stages of the COVID pandemic. Um, you can interpret that in different ways. Uh, personally, I'd say that's not as bad as we'd feared, um, but still 10% of women experiencing some difficulties is not negligible. Um, and I think there was also a pronounced fear among women who tried to access facilities um, of COVID infection. So uh, while women were able to access the services they wanted to generally, um, it wasn't without fear of COVID infection and some, uh, some effects of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Caroline? Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate, we actually uh, asked women who were not using contraception at the time of COVID, but wanted to prevent a pregnancy, what were some of the reasons why they were not using contraception? Uh, and this was specifically in Burkina Faso in Kenya. And we found between 4% 4, 4 and 14% indicated barriers related to COVID pandemic in accessing contraceptive services, but it was mostly out of fear of con contracting the virus uh, while visiting services. Mm -hmm. I know that a lot of work is done uh, in these countries to uh, create demand for contraception uh, in places where it has not been traditionally used. Are those uh, programs being impacted, do you think, Caroline? Um, so uh, definitely we have some indication that service provision has been impacted in different countries. Um, and this is actually uh, ongoing work based on um, data that has been recently collected to look at the impact of COVID in terms of service provision. And we're looking at stockouts of uh, commodity stockouts, as well as service um, um, hours of services that were disrupted, as well as closures. And I think we don't have the results of those specific indica uh, indicators yet, but um, there's a discrepancy between service disruption and actually women's actual use of contraception. One of the reasons that that might be the case is we're working in countries where a high proportion of women are using long acting methods and therefore they're protecting they're protected on the longer term even if um, services are experiencing some disruption uh, for uh, an, a you know a, a, a slight amount of time so, Phil, um, I know that the United Nations put out some statistics last month about the number of women who have had problems uh, getting family planning. I think they estimated 12 million women have experienced disruptions and leading to 1.4 million unintended pregnancies. Um, talk to me about that data and how it squares with what you found. Sure. So, I think what's What's important to remember um, in the context of the COVID pandemic, whether it involves family planning or other measures as well, is that really there, there was generally still a lack of data to inform um, what we know about the pandemic and what its impacts are. So I think anytime you look at uh, the type of projections that the UN uh, conducted in this case, there's a pretty broad range in their estimates. Um, and that reflects general uncertainty about what we know uh, in terms of the impact of COVID on various outcomes related to family planning or, or other items. So I think we did find that, like Carolyn mentioned, that some women, women were certainly impacted in terms of the pandemic, um, but uh, it's going to vary over time. So that's certainly one really important component. Our data mostly comes from the early stage of the pandemic, but it could be that the impact on family planning is much more profound as the pandemic progresses. Um, and so, you know, the slight discrepancy, what you could interpret as a discrepancy between what we found and the UN found um, could reflect the changing uh, dynamics of, of COVID uh, in these countries. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think there's a fair amount of compatibility between our results and the UN results. In fact, I think they even cited some of our data uh, that, that supported what they found. Yes. Uh, because if you take our data, it does fit within essentially their bounds and their estimates. Mm 
Yeah. I was just curious because that's such a large number that they're that they're talking about. But I do think the point that I think this is not this is a moving target and that it's very dynamic and that it's very hard in many of these countries to get the kind of data that we're talking about. And it really speaks actually to my next question, Caroline, which is some people um if you could, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, why family planning is so important and why some, in some of these countries, it can be a hard sell even in normal times? Sure. So family planning is, is an essential preventive service. It prevents unintended pregnancy and unintended pregnancy are related to a host of um, high morbidity and even high maternal mortality, especially in areas where um, service provision and, and quality of care is poor. Uh, so it's an essential preventive services and it's related to uh, substantial reductions in maternal mortality and morbidity around the world. Um, now, you know, the uptake of family planning depends on not only service provision, but it also relates to social norms and the acceptability and uh, the acceptability of uh, fertility uh, management and fertility controls. Uh, it also has to do with gender power dynamics and women's ability to set goals and their ability to actually achieve their reproductive goals. And so access to family planning and the supply of services is one aspect in which we can um, actually increase contraceptive use and allow women to achieve those goals. But there are also social norms and um, uh, social barriers to women's access to contraception. Mm -hmm. And then having COVID-19 on top of it does not help. Right, and one of the aspects that we haven't talked about but I think will be prominent uh, in, in, in the coming months and perhaps years is we've talked a lot about service disruptions is, is a major uh, is a major concern for family planning continuity. But I think what we're seeing as well is the impact of the pandemic in terms of economic hardships. And that might have sustained implications for women's fertility decisions as well as their access to any kind of sexual and reproductive health services and specifically family planning. So this is a, is a concerning trend that we need to track over time. Phil? Yeah, and, and following up on what Caroline said, one aspect that personally I, I find really interesting in the context of COVID in the countries where we work is the impact of what's really a shock um, economically and socially. In, in, in terms of COVID on women's fertility preferences. So there's, there's a decent body of literature on this, but most of it's based in US or Europe or developed you know, high income settings. Um, and I think we know a lot less about how COVID or other types of shocks impacts women's fertility preferences in uh, the places where we work. But I think you could speculate it could go in different directions where um, you could see easily how what would be true in the U.S. might be true in our context as well, where in the context of the shock and uncertainty and economic uh, declines that women might just want to wait before they have more children. But on the other, and that's the more obvious scenario. But I think we've also found some evidence that suggests that there might be something else happening, where in the context of a shock and uncertainty, women actually might want to increase their fertility preferences and increase their fertility and maybe have children earlier. Because having children for, I think, a lot of people um, in the context where we work uh, represents stability and also maybe might give them access to resources through their families um, who would provide you know, for them if they're, if they're pregnant. Um, so this is something we're still working through. We don't have a decisive answer towards, but I think those two options are fairly compelling. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, the way that uh, there's a lot of work been done into lowering fertility rates, if this sends things in the, in the opposite direction, this could have a real impact on economies in the future. 
Absolutely. Um, and again, that feeds into the the fear at the onset of the pandemic that um, there was pervasive throughout, I think, the family planning community, and, and rightfully so, that it could be especially low-income women that were more affected by COVID and access to health care. Um, and then so fertility might increase among low-income women in particular, and then they also have less means to be able to take care of uh, the children that they have with this fertility. Um, we didn't find strong evidence of that. Uh, thankfully. Um, but what we did find evidence for, like Caroline mentioned, is that all families and households and where we worked were severely affected economically in the early stages of the pandemic, both in terms of their economic well-being as well as uh, food security. Um, so that, that was certainly something we did find. And for the last word, Caroline? I just want to kind of also uh, follow up with Bill's comments because um, this, this impact and the economic impact of this pandemic might particularly affect adolescents. And this is really an area where we need to continue the work and, and track what is happening in terms of child marriage, as well as early pregnancies and teenage pregnancies. And that's definitely a concern, uh, um, global concern about how this pandemic is gonna affect the lives of young girls uh, around the world. And why would it be particularly um, have an impact on young girls? Well, one of the reasons is schools have been closed and therefore young girls are back home um, with potentially no prospects of going back to school. And the alternative, especially when, when they face economic hardships, is to find economic stability through marriage. Uh, and marriage also involves early pregnancies. Phil Anglevich and Caroline Moreau, thank you both so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagater, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.